What we've gotten really good at at Money School, BYOB, and Money Multiplier, all the same thing, is we've gotten really good at teaching the process, the infinite banking concept, because that we know is how you're going to be in control of your money. That we know is how you're going to take back the banking functions, and that we know is what's going to get you where you want to be. Not the dumb policy, and I don't mean to say it that way, but at a certain point, we just got to draw the line and say, hey, listen, what do you want? You want to buy something? Like, oh, what do you want to buy? I'll sell you something. I got some mics. I got some skate decks. I got some t-shirts. You want a product? I'll sell you a product. But why don't we teach and why don't you learn a process that will change not just your life, not just your future, your financial future, but also your future generations that you won't even be around to see. What's up, folks? It's another week, another wealth webinar. And today I figured, why not talk about our two favorite things, money and money? But well, let me refine that a little bit. Let's talk about being your own bank, okay? And how you can do that by changing just one thing. And then how that parlays into really being your own bank by actually doing what a bank does. And that would be lending, making your money go to work. So I figured we could do today's topic on two things that everybody seems to always want to talk about, and that is the infinite banking concept, the BYOB, and then how that can parlay into private money club and becoming your own bank by lending money. And in there, we'll mix in, like if people need money, how that could work. That was the, the topics that I was thinking about because everybody loves that, but I want to make this really interactive. We talk about this all the time. And every time I tell Stephen, I'm like, man, I feel like we were a broken record talking about the, the BYOB stuff. But everybody, when we ask and we do surveys or when we ask them, what do you want to learn about? This is always what they want to learn about. All the questions that come in are always about this. So let's just hit it, but let's hit it from a different angle. What do you say, Stephen? Yep. Oh, man, let's go. All right. So folks, I'm going to be doing a lot of drawing. So I played around with the screen. Hopefully you guys can see this okay here today. The first thing we need to really hit is the, the elephant in the room. The elephant is in the room is the economy and what's going on out there. I mean, you know, I typically don't want to swear on this show, but it is truly a shit show. I mean, have you looked out? Have you been outside? Have you been around? I mean, you go to a restaurant, like look at the pricing. Yeah, that's, that's a mess. You go to the grocery store, that's if there's any groceries on the shelf, that's a mess. Everything's a mess. And the one thing that I know just from all the years is, you know, in Wall Street and the years of being an advisor, I can certainly tell you this. If we want to know where we're going, what we need to do is we need to start with leading indicators. So many people are looking at different things. They're saying, oh, well, real estate's, you know, going down, but it's not going to, it's not going to tank. Well, let's look at the leading indicators. And it's very easy to see those. And the news isn't really covering this, but let's talk logistics. If there was going to be a massive slowdown in the economy, a massive slowdown in the markets, where does it start? Truck drivers. So real quick, just in the comments right now, do we have any truck drivers? Anyone in logistics? We got any railroaders? We got anyone that works for you know a shipping company, you know FedEx or UPS or even the post office? Uh, any of you drive trucks? Who do we got on here? We got any... Anyone in logistics? Let's start with this. Let's see if we can get somebody on that can, yep. All right, Jim does UPS, drives computers. That's that's a good job. Okay, Sun drives trucks. We'll start with UPS and, and the other ones here. Here we go, uh, Dixie Line Lumber. So we got we got some truck drivers. We got some people in, in logistics and shipping with UPS. We got some people that just drive computers. That would be a terrible job if you ask me. So let me ask you this. Have you seen anything different in those three different categories, like UPS. Is UPS as busy as it was a year ago? And you guys freely feel to uh, feel the need to just type it in there. Is UPS still just as busy? Now, this is a weird time to ask that question because we're going into the holidays. So all UPS drivers and all people in shipping and logistics are busier than normal, but is it busier than it was last year? Because if you look at the numbers, you look at the data, the answer is no. Okay, Dexter says, for now, people are still building and remodeling. They are because they have, they've already started the process. That's very difficult to slow that down. But we're, we, you are seeing the slowdowns in demand because the people that were buying houses a year ago are not buying houses or maybe looking to buy a house, but they, they're priced out. They can't afford a house. 
So builders are definitely scrambling right now. They're slowing down. I get the economic reports. I subscribe to several different places that give white papers talking about those economic reports. And I will tell you, builders are slowing down a lot. About It's double digits how, how much the slowdown is. So the other thing that you're seeing slow down is you're seeing shipping. Okay, Shipping is slowed down dramatically, which is why if you really paid attention to the, the headlines, Amazon is laying off a massive amount of people. They hired all these people to push all the products through because you know, I think 60% of their business is still the retail side. Most, a lot of Amazon's money comes from their, their servers and you know their server banks, but 60% is the retail side. So it's a good gauge. If we want to know if things are slowing down, well, look at Amazon because they're the, one of the biggest retailers or, or look at Walmart and, or Target and all of them are slowing down. Their, their future forecasts are lower. They're laying people off or not hiring new people and you're seeing massive slowdowns. So let's just kind of go to our audience here with our truck drivers and that. We've only got a couple comments, but right now people are still building and remodeling. Even though lumber prices have gone up, they're complaining prices are going up though. My son delivers steel all over the US, no slowdown there. Okay, again, steel and things like that are maybe a lagging indicator, but if you really, really put your finger on it, you're seeing all of that stuff start to slow down. But it's really difficult right now because we're in the midst of the fourth quarter the holiday season. And then once we get done with this quarter, we truly move into the next phase, which would be the winter season. And that's when it's all going to start to hit. I don't care what economist you follow. I don't care what you know person you look at to kind of gauge where we're going to be, but they all are saying 2023 is going to be a very slippery slope. It's going to be a slippery slope down. So all of those things play into it. And the other thing, I just got a, an article yesterday from one of these newsletters in these white papers talking about real estate. And it literally gave me the metrics, the true metrics of the entire United States and the slowdowns. And the places that were highly appreciated have seen double digits, pull, double digit pullbacks in the prices. So prices are starting to go the opposite direction. Not only that, the price of borrowing has gone the wrong way up. The price of home equity lines of credit. I was talking to somebody this morning. Their, their HELOC, which last year was uh, maybe 2.75%, I think he said, is now 7.5%. So you can see all these things are costing more, which is going to all play in to the slowdown. But you got to look at the leading indicators, not the lagging indicators, real estate lagging indicator. So you know all these things we were talking about um, here with you know steel and that stuff, you haven't seen that because that's still real estate. It's still you know building. And building hasn't really, they pulled back, but you haven't seen that because once you start a project, what are you going to do? Just be like, oh, things are slowing down. Hey, guys, guys, we're just going to stop right there. We're not going to finish this building. We're not going to finish this apartment complex. No, we're not going to build any more houses here because things are starting to slow down. No, they, they're going to carry through with their plan, but they might slow down future plans. They might slow down future forecasts. They might put some things on hold, but we're not seeing that yet. That's still six months, maybe a little less down the line. So if all these things, yep, so notice less trucks on the road. Uh, let's see, rate per mile in trucking industry have dropped from three to 250 a mile to about 230 a mile. That's good. And that's because of gas prices. But why did gas prices come down, folks? You know, well, number one, the demand is a little less because we're done with summer. But what's the other reason? Didn't our, our, our president like open up our surplus, our emergency surplus oil to reduce price? Good job. You know, like pat our hands together. That's right. They hit the reserves. Not a very smart thing. So that's kind of just the things I want to explain first. So if you're trying to get ahead of this and you're trying to look at leading indicators and then look at, you know, lagging indicators and say, well, where do I fit? Well, let's start with where is your money now? And if I were to draw out where most people's money sits, some of it sits in savings. Okay. Maybe you've been saving money. Well, we'll call it savings and checking accounts. Some of it's going to be in qualified retirement plans. Some of you have brokerage accounts. Some of you probably have those crypto FTX accounts, but we'll just leave that out. Well, I mean, some of you are going to be, in, you know, have IBC policies. And then some of you just have money buried under your mattress. Is there any other area where money might be? Oh, actually, let's go right here. This is, you know, you got equity in your house, which is slowly diminishing. So these are the different places where money sits, right? And all these places like this is a terrible place. So let's just draw an, uh, that. This right now, you're not so happy about because that's been losing money. This right here, your broker said, don't worry about it. Stay the course. It's only a paper loss. Yeah, good. This one, you're probably pretty happy because every day it's worth more. This one, you're just, you're just confused as to what the hell you got to do. And over here, 
you're happy because, hey, you got equity in your house. Yeah, well, and there's look, one more, Chris. There, there, yeah. So lines of credit, you know, outside of even a HELOC, there's a lot of other lines of credit I've been hearing people talk about. And those are a big sad face because they open those lines of credit at one, one and a half, two percent. And now they're up to seven and eight percent. So they've really quadrupled in many cases of people I've talked to lately. Yeah, I just saw that this morning, Dexter, about them stalling student loan paybacks. Well, you know, they can't get the they couldn't get it through the, the court systems to have us taxpayers pay for everybody's student loan debt. So what they did is they said, all right, well, we're just going to we're going to kick the can again on the payments. It's funny, like, I mean, whose whose can are they kicking? Is it government's money? Is it uh, institutions money? Like who's carrying the bird? Because if they keep kicking all these payments, like how are these banks and these lending institutions surviving without getting any payments on these student loans? Is it being supported? It's pretty interesting. It, it's I don't quite understand that. So if we've got all this money sitting here, the things that we really need to hone in on and focus in on probably would be the ones that are losing, right? So we want to set priorities on which ones are actually losing money or have the potential to really you know, drop in value or lose value or cost more. So if we did that, it would be 401ks. Okay, that's hot. That's a hot topic right there. Your brokerage accounts or your mutual fund accounts, whatever. The equity, because you're worried, okay, if I don't get it now, I, it's use it or lose it. Same thing with your lines of credit, because both of these are going up in cost, but that's okay. These are the different things that we need to focus on. As you all know, we often talk about changing one thing. So if we really just kind of come over here, and I'm just going to do a different color, and we say, what, what ones can we focus on? that we can make a big difference. I mean, you can make changes in these ones that are red, but what ones can we really make a massive change in? I would say would be those, your savings, just that money sitting idle, the money under your mattress, the equity in your house. We could probably say lines of credit, but I'm gonna leave those out of this mix. And what we always talk about is we talk about where that money can go and that being changing one thing, right? So this is the one change. And this is such a great time to have this discussion because when we talk about specially designed and engineered whole life, and I want to preface that specially designed, because every time we say this, there's always somebody that says, oh, my, I had my, my agent or my advisor look at this and they said, there's no way that's possible. Specially designed and engineered whole life. What do I mean by that? I mean, I'm not talking about a regular whole life. I'm not talking about the whole life that you bought four years ago from State Farm or Allstate or whatever company you bought it from. I'm literally talking about designing this whole life policy to work very different than life insurance. Very, very different. I'm literally taking it and I'm reducing the death benefit significantly. That's part of the engineering. I'm putting the death benefit at the lowest, which doesn't that sound backwards? When I'm buying a life insurance policy that Dave Ramsey said is a terrible place to put money, but yet we're going to put the lowest death benefit on it. Wouldn't I want the highest death benefit? Yeah, if you wanted to protect your family and you were looking for true protection. But what we're looking for is we want a place for our money to go for banking. Okay, that's what we want. And that's all we teach, banking. There's two businesses in the world, says R. Nelson Nash, that you should be in. Number one, the business that pays your bills. Pretty important, right? If you can't put food on the table, pay your mortgage or rent or provide shelter for your family, like nothing else matters. So your, your place where you derive an income to pay for your expenses. And the second business every one of you need to be in is the business of banking. Why? Because it's the fundamental. And if you can understand banking, you can understand control and you can understand how your money needs to work because banks have figured it out. For hundreds of years, they've figured this out. So when we design this, we put the lowest death benefit and then what we want is the highest cash value. So how we do that is we just stuff a whole bunch of cash, a whole bunch of money from these different sources into this whole life. But then we put the lowest death benefit because death benefit equals cost. I want to be very clear about that. When Dave Ramsey say, says whole life is expensive, the reason for it is the fundamental base of the death benefit is costly. That's where your costs are. In a whole life contract, really, there's cost of insurance and a policy service fee. In an IUL, don't even get me started because we'll be here for three hours just explaining all the different costs that you have to pay. So we are not talking about IULs. We are only talking about specially designed and engineered whole life. So the cost, we want the cost to be the lowest amount. So some people would say, well, why don't you put the, the death benefit at zero? Because it's not allowed. The IRS has, has figured this out. So we have to play within the IRS MEC 7 pay rule. And that's, that's the rule that we have to do. So we'll just say IRS, you don't want to mess with them. If you want this entire 
machine this entire whole life to remain tax-free, then we must make sure that under IRS standards, this thing is viewed as a, as a life insurance contract. And in order to do that, I don't know any life insurance that doesn't have a death benefit. So we got to have a death benefit, but the IRS never says that we have to have all the death benefit be made up of whole life. We can actually make a large part of that death benefit Dave Ramsey's favorite thing, and we can use term insurance. Now, we don't always want to do this, but we can, and that would satisfy the IRS requirement. So we can construct and build this thing to be very efficient, is I guess the best word, very inexpensive and very efficient. And we'll show you some numbers in a second on what that looks like for any of you that have not seen what a specially designed whole life looks like. But I'm really just trying to get conceptual part out. So remember, we're changing one thing. That one change is where your savings your lazy money, and maybe the equity that you don't have anywhere else for that money to go. IBC is already what we're talking about. So clearly that's in there. But your 401k, we want to keep, oh, shoot, I missed one. Sorry. Definitely, definitely, definitely your brokerage account money. Although it's a priority, you might want to prioritize actually keeping that money in a brokerage. So you can see we got a lot of places to think about. We got their savings. We got our non-qualified brokerage account money, not IRAs, not 401ks, because that's qualified money. We don't want to pay taxes on money just by moving it. Your IBC is just a concept, lazy money and equity. All right, so that money comes in here. But then once it goes in here, we know a couple of things to be certain. Number one, you're going to get a guaranteed interest rate. And we can absolutely sit there and say guaranteed. Number two, you're going to get a dividend. These companies that we do are mutually owned. So every one of the insurance companies we use are giant mutually owned insurance companies. Therefore, all of them have paid dividends. And every single year they've, they've been open, they've paid a dividend. It's kind of one of our, our criteria for picking an insurance company. We do not use mutually owned insurance companies that have not paid dividends or have a bad history of paying dividends. And there are some. The second thing, we want to build it within the MEC rule so that it's always going to remain tax-free. We certainly want to build it so that the cash value is the number one priority. And if that's not within what you want out of your whole life, well, then this is just not for you because you're going to get a very, it's not going to be very low, but you're going to get a lower death benefit and higher cash value. That's our number one concern. The other thing we want to make sure is that it fits all the needs and goals. We want to make sure that how we design it fits your specific needs and your specific goals. And for a lot of the high net worth individuals that we work with, one of their big things is protection. This is a huge word, preserve and protect. Well, a lot of our wealthy clients right now, this is their number one objective. They want to protect what they have. They maybe have made enough. They have the money. And now they're just sick of like losing it. They're sick of playing the game. So now they just want to preserve and protect. But in preserving, protecting, I would say a very close second to that, where they want that money ready to deploy. They want liquidity. So how do you have protection and liquidity in this same wrapper? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. But these are huge. And folks, I don't care who you are or what you're doing or what your goals are. These two should be very high, if not number one and number two. Because in this time that we're going into with this economy, this, this slowdown, this economic recession looming or in it right now, depending on how you want to decide whether we're in a recession, you want to protect what you have. Because I'll tell you, the one thing you don't want is you don't want to ride the roller coaster down and then have to fight for the next five to seven years riding the roller coaster back up. That seems like an awful long period of time. I'm 45, so that would mean if I, if I played the, the typical advisor's game and I kept my money invested and I, I just weathered the storm or I rode it out or whatever you want to call it, I literally am admitting that I'm okay with my money not being effective for me for the next five to seven years. So that would mean I'd be 52 years old my daughter, who is now two and a half, would be, let's say, five, six, seven and a half years old. I'm not willing to give up that time. And if I'm not willing to give up that much time just to get my money back, well, then I better make some protection changes right now. And during those times, the other thing that I know from when Vivi's two and a half to when she's going to be seven and a half, that five-year window, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, tons and tons of opportunities. And if I want to take advantage of opportunities, well, damn it, I need some liquidity. I need as much liquidity as I can get. So let's talk about liquidity back to these buckets. Does, does your 401k provide liquidity? Nope. Maybe up to 50,000 or 50%, but that's still got some strings attached. A lot of brokerage accounts, do they have ultimate liquidity? Because I know I bought, when I was an advisor, a, 
a non-qualified private read. It made a lot of sense, paid a good dividend, but I had no liquidity. That money is still tied up. Hopefully it goes for an IPO end of this year and I can get my, my money back and redeploy it. But you don't really have liquidity here. Maybe some brokerages. Line of credit, home, home equity line of credit. Yes, you have liquidity today, but maybe not tomorrow. So we want to make sure that we've got all these different things. If all these different things were important to you, guarantees, dividends, protection, liquidity, tax-free, well, then I, I don't quite understand why you wouldn't be considering a specially designed whole life because it fits every one of those things. And a lot of people, they'll come up with their own ideas in their head from what they've learned and false things that they've been told, or maybe just things they've been told, which are true, but not in a general, like in a general context, they're true. Like Dave Ramsey says, whole life's the worst place you can put your money. Well, if you're talking about a regular whole life that has zero cash value in the first two to three years, well, then I would say that's probably definitely not a very good place unless your sole goal is to make sure there's money that passes on when you die. But once we put the money in here and we're getting all that, the most important thing, and this is what screws people up, is we don't want to keep the money here. So let's just say we're making five to 6% with dividends. For, for some people, that's good. But for other people that say, well, wait a second, inflation right now is 7.7. .7. So if you're making five to six and you're, you're losing buying power of 7.7, .7, which is you know declining, is that suitable for you? For some people, they would say, well, it's better than the money in the bank. It's better than the money under my mattress. But Stephen, would that be suitable for you, knowing what you know, to earn five to six when inflation 7.7. .7. Not alone, right? Yeah. Right, so a lot of people out there, I'm not gonna name our one main competitor, but they're pretty big and they got very boring YouTube videos that some people love. Um, they love just selling you this. This is what they teach. They want you to buy this. They want you to say, oh yeah, this is five to 6%. It's better than your savings. Oh yeah, it's tax-free. Oh yeah, it protects you against judgments and liens. Oh yeah, there's a death benefit. But you see, we're on the other side. Like. I don't think what you need to learn is the product, but that's what you want to buy, okay? Because you think this is going to solve your problems. This is not going to solve your problems. You want to know what is going to solve your problem? What's next? And I'm going to draw over here, opportunities. Can we just go through, what, is an, what are some opportunities right now? Even into next year, what, what does everybody think an opportunity would be? So real estate, let's put real estate here. Uh, tax liens, notes, business startup, acquisitions. Uh, loaning money, private lending, buying business in distress, foreclosures, Acquisition. private funds, overages. Okay, we'll put private funds. Uh, land flipping, angel investing. So more real okay. estate, more businesses. Angel. What else we got? What's what's the easiest opportunity, folks? I mean, these these are all kind of a lot of work. I mean, doing real estate. I mean, maybe that's your category. Maybe that's what you do, but that's a lot of work. Starting a business. Tons of work, but yes, I'm, I'm not saying they're not opportunities, but I'm just trying to listen. Let's just say I'm like a lot of people. I'm, I'm looking for the, the easiest way to make money in an opportunity. How about, uh, act, how about debt? How about debt? Yeah, you already that, that's exactly what I was getting at. We're, we're going to cover debt in a second. The easiest place to make a hell of a great return is debt, but not in the capacity of what you're probably thinking. Cause a lot of people, you know, watch Grant Cardone. Oh, Grant's like, Oh, leverage the debt up. I, you know, I, that's good. And, and he's partially right. That's good. But there's a lot of debt that's bad. Again, you know, everybody on here is like acquisitions of businesses, freaking hell of a lot of work. Lending is pretty easy. Tax liens are easy. Notes are easy. Private funds are easy. So let's, um, let's do this. We're going to, we're going to do the easy. So E marks easy. Okay. Lending's pretty easy. Tax liens are pretty easy. Notes are pretty easy. Private funds are easy. Angel investing. Eh, some would say it's easy. But these, these ones here, these are, I would definitely call these hard. Angel might be easy, but it's very risky. Yeah. So and then let's do another one. Let's do a, a risky. What else do we got? Acquisitions are probably pretty risky. Yeah. I would say hard and risky. Business is hard and risky. Yeah. 90% of businesses fail. So yeah. So when we kind of dissect all the opportunities, they're all great opportunities. Let's eliminate some because they're just they, they're just too much. For some of you, they're they're always going to maintain. I'm just trying to keep this simple for the average person on here. Okay, let's get rid of acquisitions. I like it. I definitely think it's a great opportunity, but it is risky and relatively hard. Real estate, I'm not going to remove that because that's just something everybody knows. Angel investing, risky. So I'm just going to eliminate that. You know, private funds, you could also say could be risky. So, you know, we'll leave that up there, but that could be eliminated too. 
But I'm surprised when I said opportunities, this wasn't the first place people went. Let's just kind of, let's just talk about, let's get rid of these. These are all great, but let's just talk about one that I think is the easiest. And, and I think maybe a lot of people didn't talk about the opportunity of debt just because they they don't have any, right? How many of you, let's be honest, how many of you have credit card debt or have bad debt? Just put it in the chat. Just you put whatever you want. You don't have to describe it. On average, if we look at you know, opportunities, and we're going to focus on debts. This is, this is, and I just want to be very clear. I know your mind, I know your soul just wants to go out there and you want to do all the fun stuff. You want to do the real estate, the notes, you want to do the private funds, you want to do all this, but can I, can we just please draw the line in the sand here right now? If you have debt, I don't want to even talk to you and none, no one on my team should be talking to you about any of these other things until we clarify and get rid of the debt. Because this monkey right here is the one that will sink you. I don't care how much money you have to lend. I don't care what you're doing like this. And when I say debt, I don't mean all debt. I, I'm specifically talking about credit cards. I'm talking about lines of credit that are not working for you. Because credit cards, I'll tell you right now, they're, they're, they're north of 20%. If you average them out, it's probably 14. Lines of credit right now are north of 7%. Okay, so bad debt, credit cards, bad debt. Like un, and I want to be clear, lines of credit, if you use them for all the wrong things and don't tell me you didn't, like you got a line of credit and you went out and you, you bought fun stuff. You bought that patio furniture for outside. You bought that new grill to barbecue. You know what you did with that money, but I'm not talking about line of credit money. That's actually working for a spread. I'm talking about the bad lines of credit. So it's right. Bad car loans really aren't all that great. I mean, maybe you got an old car loan where the interest rate's low, but new ones, new car loans, you're over 7% now. All of these debts, if you have any of these, I'll kind of, I'll put like a little asterisk here because maybe not the car loan, depending on the interest rate. These are the first things we focus on before any of those other opportunities come in because credit cards, and let's just get rid of some of these. Let's just, let's just pretend you've got yourself some credit cards. And let's just say they average out after, I don't know, maybe you got seven cards, which is probably about the app. And they average out about 14%, probably even low. So 14%. Now let me ask you this. Real estate, a lot of people were saying rentals. Are you making more than 14% with very little risk on your, on your rental portfolios? If you are, you're way above the app. The average is I think about 7% that people are making net, not gross, net. So if you're not making 14% on your rental, then this would be a better opportunity. Flips right now, I mean, they're risky, but yeah, you could probably make more than 14%. But I bet you if you really were honest with yourself, I bet you if you were really honest with yourself, you'd find that you probably aren't making much more than 14 to 20%. Bet you you're not. And I'm just averaging a credit card out, right, at 14. So you, if you looked at all those other opportunities, private funds, very few private funds are over 14%. Private equity, maybe, but... If you blend it out among, amongst the private equity deals that make money and the ones that don't make money, you're probably somewhere close. What I'm trying to say is I'm looking for the fastest, safest way for making money. So we know that this right here, the specially designed whole life, this is not an investment. I can't stand it when people are like, oh, I want to I wanna invest in one of those IBC policies, one of those specially designed whole lives. You are not investing in it. Let's be clear. Investing involves risk. These opportunities, all those ones we had up here, that's investing because they involve risk. This has zero risk, okay? There's zero risk in the whole life. The only risk is you not making your premium payment or premium deposits in the first couple of years. That, that's the risk, but that's on you. So what we would want to do is change where the money goes first. Savings, money, lazy money, equity, brokerage money, put it into a specially designed whole life. But immediately what we want to do, and we're, we're creating a brand new program it's going to be rolled out for all of our clients. As soon as your policy is issued, it's called Blueprint 2.0. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a call with you to really flush out your opportunities, your needs and goals. So we're going to look at that. We're going to really run you through a process and find out what are your needs and goals so that we then can really help you maximize the money that's in here. So if this specially designed and engineered whole life policy has money in it, the number one thing we want to do is deploy that money. We do not want that money sitting in the whole life making five to six. Because we know that if whether that money's in there or not, we're still making that interest on all of it. Because the way we design these allows us to put money in and take money out while still earning interest on all of the money. And that's only if you have a non-direct recognition company. I wanna be clear about that because 
a lot of the other people out there that are, you know, we do Guardian and we do Penn, but I want you to be, I want to be clear, those are direct recognition. If we take a loan from one of those companies, we're going to affect how much the insurance company is going to pay us dividends on. So we're talking non-direct. And the, when we take this money out, it's always going to be a loan. Because if you create a bank, we want to take loans from our bank. Really, why do we want to take a loan? Because what we want the insurance company to do is just loan us our death benefits. So let's just write down the loan is the insurance company advancing part of your death benefit. And loan rates, I just got notified today, Mass Mutual on my, one of my new policies that's renewing, just increased from four to 5.73. So we got to understand we're in a rising interest rate cycle. So my mass policies are now going to be four or 5.73. And then I have other policies that are 4%. That's my cost, okay? This is the simple interest that is charged on the loan, which is the insurance company giving me my death benefit. So if I'm making five to six and the insurance company is charging me four, which most of my policies are, I've got a spread. If the insurance company is paying me six, but now charging me 5.73, well, that, that gets tough, okay? So now what I'm gonna lose, but that's okay because I bet you any money, mark my word on this, Knowing what I know, if the insurance company raised their interest rate to 5.73, you know what else is going to go up? The dividend. So it's just a matter of time before the dividend increases, which then gives me back my spread. Because as it is right now, my mass policies, the one that just renewed, because when it renewed for the second year, that's when they bumped it. That's a pretty shitty spread. I'm making six and I'm paying 5.73%. Okay, follow that. But I always want to make a spread. And that's my spread. So what I almost now have to do, because we're in a weird crux of a time where dividends haven't shown an increase yet, but the interest rate just started going up here. So now where I got to focus, I got to focus on this spread. So if it costs me 5.73 to use my money in that one policy, and I'm making 14, how's that spread? It's pretty good, right? So I take the money that I took from my death benefit, and I pay off all these credit cards, 14%. Now, credit cards every month, have a monthly payment that we make. Every month we have to make a monthly payment, car payment, credit card payment. That monthly payment, when you pay the credit cards off, so we just paid them off, that monthly payment, now what you're gonna do is you're gonna then send that money back to your bank. We call this a recapture. If you're gonna create a banking system and you're gonna follow what we teach, you need to be in control of all of your money. And the last time I checked, being in control means money starts in your bank, it leaves your bank, and then it comes back to your bank. It doesn't mean that once you pay the credit cards off, the extra money that you don't have to pay that monthly payment, it doesn't mean that that sits in your Bank of America account. That's not getting back control. You got to take this monthly payment and redirect and recapture that money back into your bank. And once you accomplish this, you have now learned how to take back the banking functions in your life. That is called the infinite banking concept. And then once we get rid of the, the credit cards, once all the credit cards and the bad debts are paid off, then we can have some fun. Now, let me do one more, okay? Because this is, this is a big point of contention for a lot of people. And it's difficult for me to teach because it depends on a lot of things. Most of the insurance companies we're dealing with are four to five. So let me just get rid of the five, seven, three. I'm just telling you what I, that I literally just got that letter yesterday. Most of them are four to 5%, okay? That's what it's gonna cost us to use our money. All of you have a car and most of you financed your car. And that car has a monthly payment attached to it. And most of the car loans that are out there right now over the last couple of years have pretty low interest rates. I would say less than 3%. How much is your car payment like, or the interest on your car payment? Well, that's your car payment. So Robin, like, what is the interest rate they're charging on that car loan? Four and a half, three, zero. Yeah, there's a lot of 0% cars. Robin and Matt at zero. How much is your monthly payment? 800. All right, so let's just use Robin's, okay? Okay, and, and her car payment is actually zero. If you had a car payment of 800 a month, but it was 0%, would you pay that car loan off? Stephen, would you pay that car loan off? Probably not. Okay. How about everybody else? Robin says no. That's a question. It's the question of the year. Saul knows that I'm up to something here. Uh, Michelle, no interest, to no interest to recapture. Okay. So this is a Lafayette illustration, and I'll let Chris get into what he's going to show you with the car. But just to give you a quick example of what this is. So this is a, whenever you start a policy, this is the illustration that shows the money going into it, the growth of the policy, and it projects out over the rest of your life exactly what that's going to look like. So just to give you a couple examples of that. Um, over here, this is a 41-year-old when she started the policy. So you can see how it shows, you know, the next 15 years 
of her life. And then if I kept going with the next slide, it would show you the next one. This is money going into the policy. And then over here, this is the amount that we have available for the loans. So you can see this is cumulative over time, how it grows. And this is how much the policy increases each year as you deposit the money into it. So that's just kind of what an illustration looks like. But go ahead, Chris. All right. No, that's perfect. And thank you for that. I just had to let the UPS guy in. So most of you said no, you wouldn't pay the car loan off because it was 0%. So we get trapped into this thing of thinking 0% means, oh, keep making the payment. But $800 a month, okay, that was Robin's car payment. Even though it's 0%, is $800 a month flowing to her bank or to somebody else's? Somebody else's, Ally Bank, GM Financial. You know, so right there, I want to, here, let's do the math. Now, this is just an example on Stevens here real quick. So, Stephen, let's go to, I don't know, let's go to year three, okay? Just three years. Now, my policy, so my cars, I also had a car payment that, that, that was for, it's a car we no longer have, but it was a very low interest rate. And when I did a training on it showing how I paid that car payment, that car loan off, and I then you know, took the payments back, people thought I was stupid because the amount that it cost me to use money in my policy, let's just call it 5%, was more than what the car loan was at about three. So most people would think I'm making a negative return on that money, but let's just do some math here, right? So year three, and it's going to be different for each policy. We just pulled one up. We put in 50 and we can take out 50614 So that's $614 that you made in the third year. Divide that into the 50, and that is 1.2. Hardly makes sense, right? So 1.2, so that wouldn't make sense. So let's go to the next year, Stephen, year four, okay? 53378. So if we put 50 in and we can take out 53, we made $3,378, divided into the 50 to get my return, 6.7%. It's cash on cash return. Now let's go one more year. So five years. So we made 6,005 and everybody can see how I'm doing this, right? We put 50 in and we can take 56 out. So that's a $6,595 net gain, net of the cost of that $2.7 million death benefit. There's your cost. Okay. And net of the policy service fee, which this looks to be, I think Lafayette, which I think is 50 bucks a year. So that's net net. Okay, so 6,595 divided into 50,000, 13%. So now let me ask everybody a question here real quick. And if, does anyone here have policies that are older than three years? Anyone have a policy that they've had more than three years? Some of you have just started your policies. Okay, Danny, how many years have you had your policy, Danny? Oh, okay, uh, Seth has had his guardian policy since 12, four years, two years, perfect. So Danny has had his policy four years. So in the fourth year, Danny, if this was Danny's policy, and I'm just, it's, it, it's not, I mean, it's got a dump in, so it's going to be a little bit more efficient, but 6.7%, this insurance company charges five, okay? So 5% minus 6.7, which is the true net, okay? What is, what is the spread? 1.7, right? Can you just write 1.7 there somewhere or just draw 1.7? So that's our spread in that year. So now... To ask the question, if you had a policy and you had $53,000 in it and the policy was four years old, your net spread that year is 1.7%. So if you had 53 grand, and you had nowhere else for that money to go, but you had a car that you owed 50,000 on, would it make sense, even though the car's interest rate was zero, would it make sense to take 50,000 out, pay off the car and recapture $800? Some of you are kind of thinking about it. The answer would be yes. The next year is 13. Because listen, like let's say we pay the car off this year and my spread was only 1.7 this year. The next year, my spread's eight. Okay. The next year after that, uh, whatever 9,000, here, I'll just do it real quick just so we have the number 9,985 divided by 50. So 19 minus five, minus five. So you see, folks, if you understand banking and you understand uninterrupted compound interest, and then you can just do the simple math of a spread. You can see that Robin here for her car that was $800, most of you said, no, I'd never pay it off at 0%. Now, all of a sudden, if you had a policy that had matured beyond three years in this case, so this is fourth year, and you'd have to look at your individual policy and do the math and figure it out. Would this make sense for Robin to pay off that car? She'd get a raise every year just for paying the car off. Then she'd have $800 coming back into her banking system. So $800 every month times 12 is $9,600.
let's just say you did that for three years, making money every year, that's $28,800 in cash flow you just took back and you got paid every single year in the form of a spread with your policy. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best use, but I'm just trying to explain, like, we have to look at things differently. It's not on the surface. Just like, you know, one thing that people make the biggest mistake on, they look at their mortgage, your, your house mortgage, and you're like, oh, I got one of those good ones, man. I got them when the getting was good. I'm 2.75%. 2.75% is my mortgage rate. No way. No way I'm paying that mortgage off. Okay. This is all I'm trying to do, folks, is just say, don't buy into, you know, the, the, the numbers. It's not always about the numbers. So let's just do bank rate. For, I'm just going to leave the numbers here. So let's say you got a two point. What's, what's the best interest rate? Who thinks they got the best interest rate on their 30 year mortgage? Can someone give me the lowest 30 year mortgage rate that you've got? So I want to use your numbers. Three and a half, two and a half. Ooh, two and a half is good. 2.29. Look at that. Holy cow. When did that happen? 2.25%. All right, let's use, I don't know we're gonna, if, if we're going to get better than 2.25. That's phenomenal. All right. So if you can see on the screen, I'm just, I'm just putting numbers in. Let's not get hung up on you know, the, the dollar amounts. So 30-year mortgage, 2.25. Would any of you ever pay off a 2.25% mortgage rate? See, now you guys are all onto this and you probably know that you're like, well, Danny says no, Freddie says no, but hold on. Let's just say you have one of those great mortgages, which means you would have taken that mortgage out in the last two years. So I want you to look at the numbers here. Okay, in that particular mortgage that we just looked at, it is front-loaded. In the first year, you're giving up mostly interest to the bank. Hardly, is this right? Let's see, 425. Yeah, I got the right thing. So here's your amortization, principal versus interest. You're giving 661 in principal, 637 in interest. Now, if it was a higher interest rate, it'd be very different. So see how much interest you're giving up? You're really like, yes, it's a 2.25% mortgage because that's what we just ran, 2.25%, but you're still paying the majority or at least you know pretty close to half of your money is going to interest. That's all money going to the bank. So 2023, $8,190 you gave back to the bank. Okay, the next year you gave 15 and then 22 and then see now it starts flipping in more principal versus interest. But th this is what people don't understand. Banks win, not by the rate. The bank doesn't really care about the rate. Okay, especially back when they could get cheap money from the Fed. What the bank cares about is the velocity of money. You aren't losing to the interest rate. You're losing to the velocity of interest. So when we talk about that, it, makes, it changes your perspective on how you think. I'm not saying pay off your mortgage at 2.25, but wouldn't that make you really think about it? If you were giving half or up to 85% of every payment was going to interest, not principal, it doesn't matter what your rate is. It doesn't matter that you got a 2.25% rate. I mean, unless you plan on staying in that house longer than probably, where do we break even on that? If you're going to stay in that house longer than seven to eight years, maybe it starts to make sense after that. But if you're going to buy a house and you think you might upgrade or, or refinance or get out of that house within a seven to 10 year time frame, you lost because they're winning because they understand the velocity of money. They just trick you by putting a fancy number in the, in the thing. We did a lot of teaching on this back when interest rates were this low because that's what the pitfall, people line up down the street. If one of the banks put out, we're offering mortgages at 4% fixed for 30 years, there'd be a line down the street around the block of people that wanted to, those, to get those mortgages. But the bank is laughing the whole time because they're winning. They're getting all the interest up front. And then when the time, when they get later in the deal, like they've already been paid all their money. They got it all up front in the first seven to 10 years. And then after that, then you start paying down your balance, which is what you want. So we got to we gotta focus on the velocity. I just did this car example just to show you that that still would make sense depending on the year you're at in your policy. So in that example that Stephen held up, if you were in year three or past, it might make sense to pay the car off. But let's go to the second phase, okay? Another one of the things that we talked about was real estate or private lending. So private lending is by far my favorite right now. I'm not buying any real estate. And I'm not buying any real estate because I don't like to buy assets that I know are going to go down in value, even if they're going to pay me interest. Okay. So, or I'm sorry, pay me rents. Because I know that when I when I rent a property out, I've got a tenant and that tenant's going to be more than likely a pain in my ass. I, I don't, I've only got one tenant that I can truly say isn't a pain, maybe two that aren't a pain in my ass. All the rest of them, in one way or the other, they're going to be a pain in my ass. Okay, they're going to need things. 
uh, something always breaks. And when something breaks, like you think you're doing really well from a cash flow standpoint, I can show up, I can show you years and years and years of, of cash flow and net returns. It just takes one furnace going, one sewer backing up before that whole year's profits are gone. But you don't look at that. You're just looking at the cash flow coming in. Real estate is something I'm not doing, but private lending I like because I don't have to deal with any of the, the tenant problems. All I got to do is worry about, am I going to get my monthly check? And if that's the case, that's, that's all I really care about. So private lending right now, most of the deals on Private Money Club are 12 to 15%. Somebody, I think, just posted a deal at 10% or asked me about posting a deal at 10. I said, nobody's going to bite on that. If inflation 7.7 .7 and you're, you're only paying 10 and we, we think interest rates are going to go higher, like we're, we're all of a sudden going to get squeezed. Because remember, I showed all those pockets of where money is. A lot of the lending money can come from a line of credit or a home equity line. But what's happening there? Interest rates are going up. So every, seems like every month, you're paying more to use that money. So if your threshold on your money is 10% because you lent the money out for 12 months at 10%, well, then that gets pretty difficult to make a spread if your, your money costs more. But if you're doing it from your policy, it's game on. Even at 5.73%, if I'm lending it out, and actually my, my loans right now, because I use a line of credit, and you guys are going to laugh at me. I pay 6.5. Some of you are like, well, that's stupid. Why don't you just flip them back over to the insurance company? And I'll tell you why. Convenience. I pay 6.5. I just got a statement the other day, Coastal State Bank. This is what my CV line of credit is charging me, 6.5. But that extra, um, whatever that works out to be, 5.73 to 6.5, that difference, that more, that extra that I'm paying is worth the convenience for me to have nine policies all in one place in a checkbook. Cost is only an issue in the absence of value. The value to me is simplicity and it allows me to move my money because I know I'm making 12 to 15. Six and a half minus 12 to 15 is a pretty good spread. And most of my policies are pretty mature. I got a couple that are in those first couple of years, but for the most part, I'm making a spread twice. I'm making a spread here and I'm making a spread here. Follow what I'm saying? So I make a spread between what my money costs and what I'm earning. And I also make a spread over here on what my policy is paying me. Remember the numbers, don't get hung up on the five to six, get hung up on what your policy is making in the given year that you're in. Because every year you're making more. Every year your policy is compounding uninterrupted, which means the compound interest. Does everybody understand compound interest? One year you got a hundred grand and it makes 5%. Okay. The first year you made, uh, you, you made 5% on a hundred grand. Okay. So you made 5,000 bucks. But the second year, you're, you're making 5% on the 100 plus 5% on the five grand you made. You're making interest on interest. So then 105 is what you're compounding at it at five. So you guys all understand that, right? What you probably don't understand is what that actually looks like over time. Pretty freaking impressive. I mean, that's why Albert Einstein called it the eighth wonder of the world. But I'm making a spread. One, the, the cool part about this spread, this is why you always hear me teaching this spread. And some people don't like that. But the reason I always do is because I know for a fact, every year I make more. Every year this spread gets bigger. We just demonstrated it. Every year, no matter what I do, no matter what happens in the economy, doesn't matter. I make a bigger spread each year just because of time. Over here, well, I can control the spread because I can go out and I can lend money or I can do real estate deals that are going to pay me enough to make that spread bigger. So I guess I kind of control this, but it's not an automatic increase every year. Does everybody track with that? Well, Seth said something that's pretty good. In private lending, how do you get the same tax benefits? You don't. That's, that's, a, that's a big thing. So I, I, I do want to hit that. Very important, to, important observation. So when you lend money, okay, when I lend, all of the interest that I'm making, the 12 to 15%, 100% taxable. And I got no deductions unless I'm lending out of an LLC and then I can do corporate meetings. I can do all sorts of stuff and write it off, which is how I do it. But then up here, if you own real estate, if you buy rentals or do syndications or flip houses or whatever you got to pre well forget fl flipping you got depreciation you can cost seg that you can get a tax deduction for the depreciation so if you're worried about taxes this is definitely a good way to go okay i'm not i'm not ever saying that buying real estate isn't the thing you know it's a great way to get wealthy i just right now for me specifically i'm not making a recommendation or suggestion you do what you want to do i love real estate but i just want to lend it to you right now because i just don't want to buy a piece of property that i know for a fact no ifs ands or buts is going to go down in value 
I just, that's just to me, not a logical business decision for me. Even if the rents are coming in, I just, I got a two and a half year old. I don't have time to deal with tenants calling me and freaking just this weekend, three phone calls, three, just this weekend. I don't even have many rentals anymore. So it's like, that's a nuisance for me. And I don't want to deal with, but for some of you, like this is great. Buying real estate is great, but if you're buying real estate, chances are you need money. And guess what? I got some. And I got a lot of other people in private money club that got a lot of money too. Mine's all taxable. So I'm not going to get into this, but my, my tax structure is set up in a complex trust. I've got, I've got a, my, and all my LLCs, okay? Same as what they are. There's, I think right now, 14 of them, I think we counted, 14 or 15 LLCs. They all feed into an operating LLC, okay? So then I got my operating LLC. Anything that that operating LLC makes flows to a business trust. Then that business trust makes investments, does loans, buys whatever you know investments it wants. Then from there, whatever I don't want in there flows to my family trust. And it's part of the complex trust structure. My family trust owns my house, pays for my house, pays for household expenses. Anything that's left by the end of the year, we write a check to our foundation, our 501c3. And that 501c3 now makes donations to charities. And I I like kitty cats. So we donate money to this place, 10 Lives Club. I donate money to Wounded Warrior. I got, I could show you my desk. I got a whole stack of places I donate money to, and it's all from the foundation. So I control my taxes by understanding the tax code. You control your taxes by understanding depreciation and the tax code. Point made, both are very valuable. Both are equally as beneficial. Can you get a tax deduction through putting money into your whole life? Uh, what Seth's asking is, can I get a tax deduction for putting money here? You can, but I wouldn't do it. I would advise heavily against that because now you're taking and putting, you're, you're taking the bait. You're getting a tax deduction to today to pay taxes later, okay? And I want my money in the future, the higher amount that it compounds to, to be tax-free, just like a Roth. I want to put after-tax dollars into this so that all my money is tax-free. If you take the bait and you get the tax deduction for the money going into the whole life, if you owned it with your company, what you're doing is you're foregoing the tax-free nature of the policy, unless you use trust. I mean, inside of specific trust structures, you can kind of get around some of that. But again, I'm not here to teach you that today. It's, I'm not a CPA. All right, so back to this. So now we have to decide what this opportunity is after debt's done. Maybe lending or real estate, both have admin, you know, have things that you really, you know, may seek and desire. But the other thing too that we need to do, whatever your real estate makes you and whatever your lending makes you, Let's not forget that this money needs to be recaptured back to your bank, which your bank is the, the specially designed whole life. Anything your business, your, your real estate property does or your lending goes back to your bank. Now, let me talk structure, okay? Because a lot of people are looking at that being like, well, sounds simple, but it doesn't really seem like it can be that simple. It's not. What well, it is, but it's not. So if you're going to buy real estate, chances are your real estate is going to be owned by an entity, Right. Anyone on here buying their, their investment real estate personally? If you are, please raise your hand and say, yes, I've been buying all my rentals personally because we need to have a really serious talk because I'm going to go to your house and I'm going to slip and fall. And whatever your assets are, I'm going to sue you for them. I'm just joking, but I want you to think that way. If your properties, your investment properties are owned by you personally, you are literally hanging yourself out there for a massive massive issue. So most people don't own most people don't own their real estate in anything other than an entity. LLC, S Corp, I don't care what your entity is. Maybe trust. It's in a protected entity somehow, okay? S Corps. So the real estate's in the entity. So now, if this policy is owned by me personally, I own this personally, and I want to then send that money over to buy real estate. There's an extra step. And that extra step just is the same thing. So now I can kill two birds with one stone here. If you're going to lend or you're going to buy real estate, you're going to need to understand what a promissory note is. So I'm just going to write note. And all of you have an attorney or you should get an attorney, specifically a real estate one. You should learn what a promissory note is. It's simple. Okay. It's I promise to pay back based on the terms. It's your terms. So if you own the policy and you want to buy real estate, but your entity is going to own the real estate. What you have to do is a note from you personally. So I, uh, I don't know, who can I pick on here? Seth, we're going to pick on Seth. I, Seth, lend XYZ, XZY, or XYZ, LLC, $100,000. Sorry, need more room. At 6% for 36 months. And 
$2,000 a month is the payment. I'm making stuff up. So your promissory note spells out the terms. So you personally are lending money to your entity, your entity being XYZ or whatever it is. And in this, this entity is agreeing via this note and the, the owner of the entity, you might have partners, each of you are going to sign. You're going to sign and your partner is going to sign, okay? You both signed the borrower, which is the entity, signs the note. So now your policy lent money to your entity via a note. Now your company is then, and let's just use 6% as the number because that's less than what you can get a mortgage for. Your company is then going to make a monthly payment of $2,000 a month back to your policy. And some of you are like, well, wait a second, isn't that taxable? Yes, this $2,000, let's just say represents all interest at 6%, that's all taxable. But to the company, to your entity, this $2,000 is a tax write-off, a tax deduction. Check with your CPA, but this would just be interest expense. So if this entity is a pass-through, like an LLC or an S-Corp, well, this interest expense, you know, it's basically neutral. This what washes this in a perfect world. Your CPA would do this. You're taking a deduction on the entity side, but you're taking a taxable income here, a 1099 income here. But because this is passed through, this should wash that. So really the economic benefit for doing this is you just picked up a very low risk way to make 6% because your entity is going to pay your policy back. So the same note would happen if I was going to lend XYZ. So let's just say, we're going to get rid of the real estate because that's just the way to do that. Now, let's say I'm a third party on Private Money Club. Okay. So I'm one of the lenders on there. And Seth and his entity XYZ comes to me. We're going to get rid of this 6%. Sorry, Seth. That's not going to happen. Okay. Comes to me and says, hey, I need money for my deal. And I say, great. I'm going to charge 15%. Let's do 12. I'll be nice to Seth. I'm going to charge a 12% interest. And Seth agrees. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to move to have my attorney draft a note. I, Chris Noggle, the lender or my entity that I'm lending from, is going to lend XYZ, Seth's company, we'll call it $400,000 at 12%. And I don't know, $4,000 a month is going to be the payment. Now, the extra step that I'm going to do here after Seth and his partner sign off and that, that now I got the note. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an attorney draft a mortgage and I'm going to tell Seth and his company, hey, listen, I'm going to be in first position. I'm going to have a first lien position on your property. So just so you know, if you don't pay me this $4,000, I'm going to take that pretty little property of yours. I'm going to foreclose on you. Seth says, no, 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 no. That's never going to happen. We're going to make this. And that's what I want to hear. Seth's going to make a $4,000 a month payment to my policy. And that's secured to me by the mortgage. And also then I go to Seth and I say, Hey, Seth, I need one other piece of paper. You're going to, you got insurance on that property, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Seth, well, what I want to do is I want to be named additionally insured. Either I talk to his insurance agent or he does. And they list me as additionally insured up to $400,000 because you know what, if Seth's property burns down or gets hit by a hurricane or is no longer there, I don't want Seth to write me a check. Seth's kind of grieving. He's pissed. He just lost his property. I want the insurance company to write me a, a check. So the insurance company says, yeah, that damn hurricane. Sorry, Seth, your house is gone. Thank God you were not in one of those excluded flood areas, but you know, you no longer have a house. So the insurance company is going to, we're going to, we're going to reimburse you the, the, um, what do they call it? Replacement cost. Oh, but Seth, this guy, Chris Noggles on your policy for 400,000. So we're going to pay him out first. First 400 is going to go to him because we, we don't want to lean on this property. So we're going, to, we're going to pay that lien off. And then Seth, we're going to give you the rest to rebuild your property. So I protected myself against unforeseen. I protected myself against Seth not being a good borrower. And I laid out the terms. And now all of a sudden I've got myself a deal. And Seth is now making $4,000 a month payments. Now what's the downside to me? $4,000 a month in taxable income. At the end of the year, Seth's company is going to 1099 me saying, hey, we just paid you, uh, I don't know, let's just say he pays me 30,000 over the course of whatever that is. I'm just making it up. That's taxable income. Then comes the trusts and all that good stuff. So does everybody, under everybody understands that, right? So we went over three different things. We went over opportunities and those opportunities for your policy. The money, and I want, I want this to be clear. This is where the money always should start. Always, your, your lazy savings, your money that you have, I don't care if it's your money in your company or your money personally. If you've got money that you keep in your savings account that exceeds three to six months of expenses, what are you thinking? Why are you helping the bank? I wanna know something. If this is you, and please don't admit that you are this person, but if this is you, 
you got hundreds of thousands or a bunch of money sitting in a savings account. Why? The bank doesn't even send you a Christmas gift. They're not going to give you those little speakers, those wireless speakers at the end of the year. They're not even going to send you a thank you letter. None. And they're not paying you hardly anything because they don't have to because they don't need your money. So why in the world would you just keep money in a savings account? I'll get, there's only one answer. It's because it's what you've been told to do. Or maybe you're nervous now and you're like, well, I don't know. Like, I, it's guaranteed, which really it, it is up to 250000 so they say. That would be a big no-no. If you got money in a brokerage account right, right now, what, do you, what are you accomplishing? Are you making money? What are you investing in? You buy an Apple, AT&T? Did you buy Netflix? Did you buy Meta when it went down? What are you trying to accomplish in here? Are you a professional stock trader? Because chances are any money that's in a brokerage account right now is losing money. Or maybe you've sold some of them. You just have that money sitting in a money market inside the brokerage. Again, why are you trying to help Wall Street? First, you were helping the bank, and now you're trying to help Wall Street, and you're just giving them money to use. Why? Shift that money. Change where that money goes. Take that money out of their hand and put it in your hands. Put it into your bank where you control it, where you're making an interest rate and have all the things that you wanted. Equity in your house. Why isn't that money out there working? I just was on the phone with a really dear friend of mine. He's in California. He, he tells me openly, he says, hey, Chris, I need your help. I got a million dollars in equity sitting in this house and I don't know what to do. He said, have you heard of private money? Well, he knew about private money club. He's like, you got you to get me into this. You got to tell me how this works. I said, it's easy. It's like dating. You just go in there and you just look through deals. So I'm, I'm in here. I got an interest calculator. All right, I'm a lender at 12%. Uh, here, let's actually get the number. Seth wanted 400 grand. He was, I was going to lend it to him for 12 months. I don't lend any longer than 12. Holy crap. I, I thought I was right when I did the 4,000, but I, I was guessing. So I guess it's simple math. So, all right. Just, just to teach on that real fast, you have to put 12 in that or else it won't work. So always put 12 in that second line. Let's hear. I'm going to come in. I'm going to look at active listings. So this house just got posted. I don't know why they don't have photos up, up yet, but this one here is the one that I kind of liked. Single family house deal, an upcoming neighborhood in, I like it because it's Texas. Now you can see this looks like your typical flip. Total needed 218. I have a lot of questions. 2211, you know, back right, all this info. I can look the address up right here. I can actually put it right in house folios and I can research it and underwrite it. But I thought this was a, a I, I just think Texas is a good place to invest. So you can see the map, you can get all the information, you can look at the financials on the property. But down here, she bought it for 158,000, okay? So she bought it for 158, rehab and, fin and furnished, 60,000 ARV, let's see, re that's the, see, ARV is 265, 60,000 rehab. So that's how she's arriving at this price. Would I lend 218 on this deal? No, I don't ever lend 100%. So I'd wanna know how much, uh, Michelle is going to put into the deal. And if it was nothing, then I wouldn't lend, or I would just lend up to what I'm comfortable lending up to, which would be about 70% of the 218 or 200. I might use this, might 70% of the ARV if I verify that number. This is a good deal. Okay. So I would look at that one. Let's see what other ones got a 12% or this is a really nice one. The only reason I don't like this one is it's 48 months. I'm not lending out 48 months, but for somebody that was interested in it, seeking a loan of 200,000 at 12% interest only for 48 months, second position. So two strikes, number one, 48 months, number two, second position, not my cup of tea, but that's a nice looking house. Tennessee, good area too. Curtis, you know, he's got a good deal. just doesn't fit my criteria. This, I tried lending on this one, but he already got it funded. So this particular deal I liked, I didn't like the way he did photos, but I did already kind of help him and give him some advice. So this deal I actually wanted to lend on. I, I was psyched about lending on it, but uh, somebody beat me to the punch and, and lent on it first. So it was in Indiana, which is an area I do like, but it fit my criteria for everything I wanted. So, you know, if you're looking for a deal, you just go on here and you can just browse through and you can just check out all the goods and all the deals. New deals are going up every day. You know, once I see photos on this, typically I won't even look at a deal, but I know this lender or this borrower. I've lent a lot of money to him. Uh, over the years, he's paid back every loan. He's connect He's usually doing deals with Chris Rude, just to give you some context. But I've always loved his deals. He's very professional, very good at doing what he does. He'll have a whole packet. So if you ask him about this deal, he'll be able to send you an entire kit on this. He'll also send you his personal financial statements, which show all the real estate that he has. This one's in Louisiana, which is where he does most of his deals. So yeah, I'm just trying to give you just some of the opportunities that are in private money club, but these are these are great uh, opportunities that you can use. But again, stop keeping money in stupid places. Start reallocating money that has the potential to go down. 
Get it into a place where it's secured, guaranteed, and safe that gives you liquidity of that money. And then giddy up and go and find yourself an opportunity on where to move that money. I don't care if it's lending or buying real estate or notes or whatever it is you want to use the money for. Just control the spread. So always control the spread. If it's debts that you have, focus on the debts. Is somebody was saying like, what's the best way to get equity out of your properties? And, you know, we can get into that HELOCs and HELAs and different types of, of ways to tap into that equity. But we actually spent three full days going through all of this, like in full detail. And we dug in deep on the equity aspect. And we brought one of our experts on, Matthew Sullivan, that does home equity loan agreements and compared and contrast a little bit between HELOCs and HELAs and what Joe does with his policies in combination with the HELOCs. So what Chris decided to do this week was to offer our Money School community a Black Friday sale. So what we did is we bundled up our entire Money School Essentials three-day training, which we've been doing these for three years now, four of them every single year. And this last one was by far the best one we've done. So we bundled it together. We put it into a time-stamped way where you just want to learn about HELOCs and HELAs. You can just go right to that section, click on it, skip right to it. But we did these recordings and this whole package for you, and we decided to give it to you for 90% off um for for a black friday bundle so i'm going to put that in the chat box but if anybody's interested i would highly recommend it just to give you an example aaron just posted a minute ago and aaron's been to a bunch of our money school essentials classes he comes to our masterminds um aaron's an awesome guy and he just said thank you for the bundle because he purchased it not for himself because he's been there live but he purchased it to give to somebody, uh, somebody in his family as a Christmas gift. Oh, that's really nice. That's, a, that's an excellent, I mean, what other, what better gift than financial knowledge like this can you give to somebody that you truly care about in your life? So I'll put the, the link for that, but check it out if you have any interest in getting in deeper into this stuff and uh, get a 90% discount for doing 40, so. That's 47 bucks, right? 47, correct. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so we can get on these questions. Sorry, I just saw that one. It reminded me of that. So I wanted to uh, make sure I brought that up. So uh, Danny was asking earlier, what are the best to recommend to non-recognition companies that provide this type of guaranteed interest rate? And Danny, we could get into the companies, people like One America, which is AUL, uh, Lafayette Life Insurance Company, um, SML. You know, we use a handful of companies for this. But the good news is you don't have to worry about that really because we're going to do that behind the scenes for you. So what we do as a company with the money multiplier is we work with our clients. So people like you, Danny, hey, this looks like a great concept. Well, how do I get started? Where do I go? That's what we do. So I'll put my information in the chat box. But if you want to schedule a call or shoot me an email, uh, let's just hop on the phone for 20, 30 minutes. We'll talk about what your situation is, what this looks like for you. And, I'll, and, and by hearing what you have going on and how much you want to fund it with, that'll give me an idea of which company is the best company to use for your situation because some companies are, are better for different ages some are different for different funding amounts and we have you know so many years of experience doing this now that we can say okay what you want to accomplish what your goals are putting this money in this is the best company for you so that's what we do behind the scenes through experience so you don't have to worry about that but those are some of the companies that we use just to give you an idea of it danny um, so lending money, he said, don't I have to lend my money, uh, my lend to my entity, the money from my IBC in order to loan uh, on private money club. So no, if, so if you're lending through an LLC, then you would want to do that. But if you're just lending your personal cash, then you would not have to do that. Right, Chris? So here, let, let's just do this two different ways, right? See, so, whoops, actually, we can just do this side. one. Sorry, I screwed that up. So you got your money in your specially designed whole life, your IBC policy, and there's two different ways. So you want to lend money on private money club, okay? You can lend direct personally. So you can just do a personal loan and then get do the note, the mortgage, and the insurance. Some people, what they want to do is they want to lend from their entity so they can get some write-offs. So in that case, what you would do is you would lend that money to your entity, Okay. And the only added step here is if you're going to lend money from you, this is your personal policy to your entity, your LLC, what you're going to want to do is a promissory note from you to your company. I charge my company 6%. I've always done the same. I just keep charging 6%. Then from your entity, then you lend the money out through private money club and then 12 to 15 or whatever, you know, the interest rate is that you're seeking on there. So then you do this. And then over here, you're going to do, you know, the the three, the note, the mortgage, the insurance. So all you're doing is just adding a step, but that step enables you to then run all the income 
So then when you do this, this lender or this borrower is going to pay back your LLC. So your LLC can control taxes a lot better because you can write a lot off. And then the only thing you're getting taxed on, if you kept it that way, if you kept everything in your LLC, is you're going to get taxed on the flow through. Okay, so we'll just put the flow through and you're going to get taxed on the 6% your company pays you back. This is very common. A lot of people are doing it this way. They're lending money from their personal policy to their entity so that their entity can do all the things that an entity does, write things off. And then from their entity, they're lending on private money club. But you don't have to do it that way. You can do it either way. Sorry, I'm very visual. So I just felt it was easier to show it that way. All right. So Michelle said, would you do what you did for the car payoff example to pay off a $90,000 student loan first? If it's your only debt right now, start recapturing there before lending, multiplying your money, or can you do both if you're doing a dump in? Two questions, Michelle. It would depend on how your, your student loan is. Is it simple interest or is it amortized? If it's amortized, probably. It's tough. We haven't really for years been talking much about paying student loan off because of everything the government's done with kicking the payments. So if you're not making monthly payments to, on your student loans, then don't pay them off. If you're making monthly payments to your student loans, a couple questions. Number one, is it interest in principle or is it just interest? Simple. So is it an interest only loan or is it interest in principle? Most are interest in principle. What is the interest rate? And then ask for an amortization schedule. And then that would help you make that decision. Yeah. So Seth, I just answered in the chat, but Seth's just saying, can you partially fund in private money club? And uh, yeah, many borrowers are, are, do that. Um, it's a state by state rule. So not all, but I've seen several on there where um, they, they, they take, you know, if they need 250 total, they'll take a hundred from one person, 50 from two people and, you know, 25 from two more or whatever, and put that together um, or whatever that looks like. So yes, that does happen quite frequently. This is recorded. Yeah, Lawrence, we, we do. We record these Zooms. We put them on Chris's YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube at the Chris Noggle and hit subscribe and ring that little bell that's sitting there, it'll alert you whenever we put this up so you can go watch it or share it with others. And we appreciate that. If you guys could subscribe, it does help our um, YouTube algorithms and all that. And we can get this messaging out to more people, which the, today in today's age is more important than ever that people learn the truth about money and how to control it. So appreciate you subscribing to the channel, sharing sharing it with others. And this recording typically gets put on on Monday or the latest on Tuesday, the following week. So it'll be coming up this coming Monday on YouTube. Uh, Todd said something about, um, there is a really cool program. Uh, most of you already know about it, you know, investing in real estate projects that are opportunity zones. They have great tax advantages, uh, eliminates all capital gain taxes. So if you're looking for things from a tax play in real estate, opportunity zones are that. Uh, I've seen several of them flow through private money club where people are raising money to buy in an opportunity zone. So it can be very advantageous. I'm not an expert in it. So consult with an expert on that for, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So Matt, when, when I mentioned, I talked about a hurricane and, you know, like natural disasters, but definitely for slip and falls. But if you're a lender, like if you're just lending to a company, like you don't have liability for a slip and fall, but the, the owner or the borrower does. So you want to make sure that they have not just, you know, the liability, you want to make sure they're protected, you know, for everything. So you want to read the contract or have Get an insurance professional on your team that will review the contract to make sure that everything's covered. All right, so if someone slips and falls, are they going to be okay? How much are they covered to? Okay, then you go back to the borrower and you say, hey, you need to increase that coverage because if someone you know falls off a ladder on your project and you get sued, like I want to still get my money. So I want to make sure you're protected for liability and also for natural disasters and things of that. So you want to join Private Money Club. Let me log out and I'll show you exactly what you do. You go to Private Money Club. So you're going to come to a page like this again, very soon, hopefully a week or so, this will be completely redesigned. You just click and I don't care where you go. You can go down, but just click join now. It'll bring you here. You can watch the show premium membership. So you click here on premium membership. It's 1497 a year. You put your information in. You can see I've already done it. You agree to the terms and you do that. So that's one way. Or what you can actually do is you can just call 833-JOIN. PMC, and then you can set up a demo call where they'll run you through the software, show you how it works, kind of how I did it, to show you all the different functionality and all the different features of what you can do in the platform. And then you can basically buy right there. And uh, hint, hint, I'll just let the cat out of the bag. Right now, just like we have a Black Friday sale going on on the three-day training, and any of you that wanted to take advantage of that for the, I think it's 47 bucks, there's the link for that. But if, we also have a Black Friday sale going on for Private Money Club. So 
I think until next week, it's you have a $500 coupon that they'll give you if you do the demo call only. It's only if you do the demo call. So 833-JOIN-PMC, and you can then book a demo call. I actually put the demo um, I actually put the demo link right in the chat box if they just want to schedule okay. right from there. And they're able to do that as well. And um, Matt said, I tried to join PMC, but it said no, because I'm in Idaho. So Matt, all that means is if you're a borrower, you can't list the property in Idaho right now. But if you're looking to be a lender, it's perfectly fine. Um, and if you have you know, real estate you're looking to borrow from, what I would do is I would join now, take advantage of the discount for Black Friday and start networking. Just reach out to lenders. Hey, I'm in Idaho. I can't you know, post the deal yet, but I'm building relationships. And as soon as we have Idaho and some other states onboarded, which should be very soon, uh, you'll be able to post deals and, and you're good to go from there. But you know, it takes time to build that relationship. So get started now while you can with this discount, start building those relationships. And as soon as you're ready to go, or if you're a lender, it's a moot point. Yeah, the, the excluded states are just to post the deal, not you can lend. It doesn't matter if you live in Idaho, you can lend as much as you want. It's just the ability to post the deal will be restricted. I was late onto this wealth webinar because we were on the phone with the attorneys. So we're, we're working through all of that right now. It's just uh, the legal environment behind private money club is, well, I'll just say complex because nobody's done it before. It's super fun for us to go out there and to to say, oh my God, private money club, never been done. We're, we're a blue ocean. But the problem with the blue ocean is it's just like, okay, now we're out here. Has anyone ever swam out this far? Like, what does it look like? Like what, what critters are under the water? Do I need to work? Like nobody knows. So the, the attorneys are kind of, I don't want to say scrambling, but just literally having to call all the regulators of each individual state to say, hey, guys, I know what the law says on these things, but we got this thing down here. Like, what do you think? And it's just been complex, which has been the holdup. Um, but we're getting through it. We're getting through it. And uh, we will definitely succeed in that. Yes. Yeah, so so saying, are there apartment or multifamily deals on PMC? Yeah, lots. lots. Um, I don't, let's there's, see, there was just one just that was- to clarify, there's, there's no funds and there's no syndications, but there is a couple direct lending deals with multifamily going on. I'll also say apartment complexes have really taken a hit over the last couple of years on a profit side. I mean, cap rates- have really dropped. What, what's going on is the hedge funds has really jumped into the game and just really kind of made it very tough for apartment complexes for, for investors like we were doing five, six plus years ago. So, uh, you know, Chris, you actually posted that uh, picture the other day, you know, showing the different cap rates of apartment complexes. And it's really, it's really mind, you know, it's kind of open, mind opening to see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's a lot yeah. of changes going on right now, but there's definitely yeah. multifamily yeah. stuff up on there. Real fast what we're talking about. Um, you know, saying a six month treasury bill is now more profitable than a apartment, a carpet, some of these apartment complex cap rates, you know, they've kind of gotten there. So it's pretty wild what's going on right now. If you guys watch WTF, uh, which we do every Wednesday morning, uh, we were talking a lot about that this morning. Uh, Richard said BlackRock threw a wrench into the machine. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you think they were going to do? Like they play that they play the game well and they got all the money in the world to do it. So they're going to keep throwing wrenches. You're going to see a right. lot of weird things over the next couple of months and the next year, but it's not most of it's not going to be good, but there's still lots and lots of opportunities if you play the game right. But again, for me, and this this isn't a suggestion for any of you, you guys are probably much better real estate investors than I am. For me, I don't want to buy an asset that I know is going to go down in value right now. Even if it pays me rent, I can make my rent, quote unquote, in interest by owning nothing and controlling everything. And, you know, the Seths, the Todds, the Richards, you guys can manage all the tenants you want. I'll just provide the money and you just give me the security so that I don't have to own anything, but yet I can control everything. And gosh, I always thought I understood that, but now I truly live it and I truly understand it. Can we post land deals? Yeah, yeah, there's there's land deals. So like, it's like, as you guys are asking questions, I would just tell you, go to Private Money Club and just look. I mean, there's a land deal that just got posted um, and he's a, good, he's a good borrower. I don't lend on land, but yeah, right here, Smoky Mountain Cabin. So this is cool. I'll, I'll just show you. There's a lot of land deals that have gone up in here. And from, from what I know, I think they've actually done good. This one probably will be tough because he's only offering 10%, but you could negotiate that. 175,000 needed, but here, look at this thing. He's, he's actually going to develop this. So he's going to build a hideaway. This is pretty cool. Log cabins, like who doesn't love log cabins, right? So that's a, that's a land deal right there. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is at 10%. So 10% wouldn't get it done for me, but it is only 12 months. 
So I like that. I'd probably go to Tyler and say, hey, Tyler, and I know Tyler. Um, I'd probably say, hey, man, I, I'll do the deal, but can you pay me 15%? You know, because it's broad land, so it's riskier for me. He's got to build the property. There's changes. It, a lot of things can happen, but there's his number. You could just give him a call and you could just have at it with him, you know, chat with him. You know, there's so many different ways to use this. We always just brush the surface. But the one thing is, you know, don't get into the weeds on it. It really, like everything we just showed you, it's it's that simple. A lot of people spend all their time and research and, and, and energy focusing just on this. Like on, on this is all they focus on. Oh, the whole life and what company and what should I do? And should I do this design and that design? If this was the most important thing, we would have spent an hour and a half talking about this. We spent about 20 minutes talking about this and we spent all the rest of the time on a process. And the most important part is where does your money go to work for you? This is how you become wealthy. This is how you basically make all the money. This, this is just where your money starts. This just becomes your new bank, your new machine that you run money through. That's it. Don't glorify this, okay? Don't make this out to be some great, awesome, un unbelievable thing. Yes, is it needed? Yeah, this process works a hell of a lot better if you got a place to save money and, and use money at the same time and make money the spread. And Now, that makes a lot of sense, but this is not the most important thing. The process of the money moving, the process of where the money goes, that's what matters. And I just can't preface that enough because I know we teach that all the time. We might, you know, we're, you know, my, ourselves and a couple of our, our other friends that do this, you know, teach the process. But there's a lot of people coming into our space right now and all they're teaching, all they're talking about is selling you a damn product. And I know it's so easy. Oh, I just want to buy a product. I just want the car. I just want that machine. If that's all you do is buy the machine, you miss the whole thing we just did for an hour and a half. Because this, although better than what you're doing now. This is not where it starts. So please just focus on the process. Focus on moving the money, controlling the money, making the spread, but don't make it all about the, part of the product. I mean, the product's just a piece of the component. What we've gotten really good at, at Money School, BYOB, and Money Multiplier, all the same thing, is we've gotten really good at teaching the process, the infinite banking concept, because that we know is how you're going to be in control of your money. That we know is how you're going to take back the banking functions. And that we know is what's going to get you where you want to be. Not the dumb policy. And I don't mean to say it that way, but at a certain point, we just got to draw the line and say, hey, listen, what do you want? You want to buy something? Like, oh, what do you want to buy? I'll sell you something. I got some mics. I got some skate decks. I got some t-shirts. You want a product? I'll sell you a product. But why don't we teach and why don't you learn a process that will change not just your life, not just your future, your financial future, but also your future generations that you won't even be around to see. It'll change their financial futures. That's it, folks. That's the most important thing. It's correct, Richard. The product is just the vehicle. That's all it is. It's just the vehicle. You know, you want to go to a beautiful destination. You want to take a big road trip like the car. It's just the vehicle that gets you there. Hey, you can ride in style. Great. But when you get there, when you get to Mammoth or wherever you're going in the car, you're like, oh my God, look at how beautiful that is. That's what matters. That's what we're trying to teach you here. So does anyone have any final questions before we wrap for the day? Now, if anyone has any questions that you think of after, we do an, a happy hour, Ask Me Anything, today at 4.30 Eastern. And to join us for that, it's simple. Either you have to be part of one of our Facebook pages. So the Infinite Banking page on Facebook is a great one. Just go onto Facebook and you know get in the Infinite Banking group or just go to my YouTube channel, which is at the Chris Noggle. You were watching one of the videos earlier and subscribe and it'll notify you. Make sure you click the bell though. The little bell in the corner, you got to hit that bell and that'll notify you when we go live for Ask Me Anything. But other than that, you know, we just, we want to do the same thing we talk about a lot, but go deeper into it and just kind of really focus on a couple of things. And hopefully, you know, you picked up a couple of golden nuggets and hopefully uh, it got you to start thinking a little differently about what you're doing with money and how you're doing it. And uh, we'll just keep bringing it to you. Yeah, I just, I just had one more here. And, and funding the whole life policy and paying yourself back, what happens when you're not making money to pay yourself back? or somebody you lend to, what suggestions are there in that scenario? Yeah, and Seth, that's going to happen. And let's just use it in the, in the sense, and I'll give you an example. Okay, this is a personal example. Back many years ago, you guys can look it up, 55 Newman Place, Buffalo, New York. It's a duplex that me and my wife bought and converted into a single family. And we funded it with, with my, my policies and, and I think Larissa's policy too. But we got into it and the deal just went south. And it took years to complete this deal. 
I couldn't make payments back to myself. I just couldn't. We didn't have the cash flow to do it. So I had all these loans out on my policy and I couldn't make any payments back. So you know what I had to do, Seth, is I had to go to myself. I had to go in a mirror and I was staring in this mirror and I'm sitting there and my tail between my legs and I'm saying, all right, bank, I can't make payments. Sorry. We don't have the money. We can't make the payments that we agreed on. I know we were supposed to pay you 6%, but here, how about this? Is it okay if I just pay you the payments when we sell the property? But I don't know when that's going to be. And then in the mirror was a reflection of myself. But I was talking to my, my banker self. And my banker self says, sure, Chris, um, you know, just don't forget, don't steal from, from your bank, but you can pay back anytime you want. So what we did is we finished that property. We sold it. You guys can look it up and see what we sold it for. And then when I sold it, I paid my policy back, the principal, plus I couldn't pay all the interest back because we didn't make enough, but I paid whatever interest I could back to myself. And it was a win. It was, it was a win. Maybe not the exact win that I was hoping, but that's the thing. So Seth, if you can't pay yourself back, like you just got to ask yourself permission to set up different terms. You're the bank, which means you control the, the terms. So if you lend to somebody else and they, they can't make payments, well, hopefully you got the mortgage in place. You can take the property. Same idea. Hey, bank, talk in the mirror. We're going to be uh, having some experience, some problem with this Seth guy. He's not making his payments to us anymore. So I'm going to start the foreclosure process and eventually we'll, we'll get the property and we'll sell and we'll be able to pay the loan back. But is it okay if we modify and extend this, this term? Sure. It's, it's just you. Same thing with the premium deposits. Like when you build the policy, you might say, all right, I want to start the policy that allows me a hundred thousand. And I don't, know, whatever your number is, a hundred thousand dollars a year. You want to have the ability next year. Things don't go as planned. Things are rough. You can't make a hundred thousand dollar premium. So great. Let's reduce it. So usually we'll have the ability to reduce Usually it's more, but let's just say from 100, I don't know why I did a percentage, from 100 down to 40,000. So if 40,000 is not enough, well, when we build the plan, tell us what you want that, that low and high to be. 100 would be your ceiling, but then tell us what you want the minimum to be. Okay, you're comfortable with 25,000? Great. We'll build the policy with a minimum of 25 and a maximum of 100. We can design the plan any way you want because we don't ever want you to get into a situation where things change and all of a sudden you can't fund your premium deposit. And you're like, oh, what a waste. This thing sucked. Those guys taught, didn't, didn't do me any service. Like I didn't have flexibility. Yeah, you did. We build it in. Just tell us what you want. I love it, man. I love it. I'll leave you guys with this right here. <laughs> <laughs> I know a bunch of guys like that on Private Money Club. Exactly, man. Awesome. I know you're, you're one of them. All right, folks. Well, happy Thanksgiving from all of us here at Money School, Money Multiplier, and Private Money Club. Enjoy your families. Don't look at your phone on Thanksgiving. Just enjoy the day. And uh, for all the rest of you that uh, just can't get enough of us, we'll see you at 430 at Ask Me Anything. And I think I got to go get some beer because I, I definitely want to get a beer before uh, that one finishes. With that being said, to everybody else, happy Thanksgiving. We will see you next week when we're back at it. And uh, to, from all of us at our family to your family, enjoy yourselves. Give a lot of hugs. And show a lot of love. Talk to you soon. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.